Praise the Lord. Welcome to our Thursday evening Bible study at Cross Life Fellowship Church in Tuttle, Oklahoma. We're glad that you're able to listen. If you're obviously you are listening, I mean you're that you're listening to this recorded uh, Bible study. We're in the book of Joel. We've uh, gone through chapter one. We're looking at the prophecy of Joel, which as we've covered before, took place approximately the scholars say of a hundred years or so before that of Jeremiah and before the time that, that uh, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar would come and overtake Judah because of their sin. The, you know, Judah was the southern kingdom of Israel. They were the last, if you will, to fall. And at that time, as, as we went through the uh, prophecy of Jeremiah, as we went through that book of Jeremiah, we saw that you know, after that time frame, it, 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 it marked a, uh, a shift, I guess, if you will. It marked a point in time to where it was what the Word of God calls to the time of the Gentiles. Because at that time, whenever Israel fell there in the time of Jeremiah, approximately, I guess, about 24, 2,500 years ago, Israel ceased to be a... a a nation really at that time there was still a people there were still people in the land of Israel but they ceased to be a nation where they had their own king their own army and so forth from that time forward there in Jeremiah which was approximately they say a hundred years after this prophecy of Joel at that time Israel ceased to be a nation and they ceased to have any really worldly influence, they were, at, after that time, they were in one way or another in bondage or governed by a Gentile nation, whether it was uh, the, 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 the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, the Roman Empire or whatever. And it was not until 1948, some you know, 2,000 or more years, that God once again brought His people back into the land of Israel and established them as a nation like we see them today. And that is one of the, the prophecies of the Old Testament, of the Old Testament prophecy where God would regather His people and establish them once again. And now we see, and we'll see here in chapter 2 of Job, but we see today, if we just look at the headlines in, in the news, the, the real news, not the fake news that we have going on, but we see those headlines and we see, you know, Russia and, and Saudi Arabia and, and Iran and, and all these other nations that are forming alliances. We can see that as we, as we will look here in a minute that in Ezekiel's chapter 38, you know, there is coming an alliance and there is coming an, an army that is going to come against the people of Israel. We can see that today forming. We see that the, the infancy, if you will, of that formation of those nations that will seek to destroy Israel, the battle of Gog and Magog. You know, what we're going to see here in chapter 2, there's a, there's a lot of similarities between that battle of Gog and Magog and the battle of Armageddon. You know, scholars say that this, this chapter 2 is more so talking about the battle of Armageddon than anything else. Ezekiel's chapter 38 and 39, that's the battle of Gog and Magog, which in my understanding is a battle that is soon to come. You know, it is a time whenever Russia and, and those armies will come against Israel and try to defeat Israel. Now, there's a possibility too, I mean, my understanding may be wrong there, but that the battle of Gog and Magog is the battle of the Antichrist, but I'm not real sure about that. I mean, some who are better scholars than me might, might understand that better. So anyway, as we get into this, we'll, we'll kind of look at it and see and, and we'll go back. But whichever it is, God knows. And His prophecy, the word that He's given will be fulfilled. It will take place. And that's something that we need to understand. And, and we're, we're going to try to get down to the 11th verse here. And, and uh, you know, it, 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 it talks about that that day is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. It is spoken in God's Word. And what do we know about God's Word? 
We know that if God has spoken it, it will take place. Whether we really underst whether we understand it in its fullness or not, it doesn't matter. God knows. His word, he, it says His word is for no private interpretation. God meant what He said and He said what He meant. He knows what's going to come to pass and it will be fulfilled as God said it will be fulfilled. It doesn't matter if it's the devil or some demon spirit. It doesn't matter if it's some man or nation or whatever it might be. They will not thwart. They will not make of none effect God's word. God's word. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. His word will be fulfilled and it, it's, it's uh, needful for you and I to understand that and to get that into our heart and have that as a settled fact. Because in this day and age that we live, there are so many people, so many voices, I mean more so now than ever before because of the internet and YouTube and you know whatever, Facebook or Getter or whatever it else may be, you know, these, these different platforms that you have every message from every thought, from every mind coming. And a lot of times it's hard to uh, know who's right and who's wrong, it, but we can know that the Word of God is right. Men may have different interpretations, some right, some wrong, some will be right, some will be wrong, you know, but if we just stick to the Word of God, we don't have to worry about it. We just stick to, we just say, Lord, I trust in you. What this guy says may be interesting. It may be, it may sound good. You know, and this one may say something totally opposite. You know, but we need, that's why we need an understanding of the Word of God. So that we can have the, you know, we have available to us the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. You know, we have Him to lead us and guide us into all truth. And it's to our benefit and to our, uh, in our best interest to study God's Word, spend some time in His Word, you know, on a regular basis asking Him. Because if you ask Him, He's going to reveal it to you. He's going to show you. God doesn't have anything hidden from any of His people, any of His children. You know, God's not got saying, oh, it's, you can't have that. It's, you know, I got it behind my back. God has it for you. He's just waiting for you to seek it, to seek Him for it. Amen? Amen. So chapter 2. Verse 1, we have what is the beginning, you know, I, I believe it is the beginning of, uh, or it is the battle of Armageddon. It speaks of, you know, that judgment that is to come. What we will see here in these, these first 11 verses of this chapter, you know, as you, as you read it, you need to understand that what we see here, this is the army of the Lord that is coming back with Him. You know, these are those who are riding on those white horses whenever Jesus comes back to wipe out the Antichrist, to put an end to his, his attempt to destroy the people and the nation of Israel. But in, in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, Blow you the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain." He said, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. 26 or so hundred years ago, Joel would write this and he would give this warning and this warning has been just as uh, 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 needful then as Joel was prophesying to the people of Israel. He was blowing, he was sounding forth that trumpet call. He was giving that word of thus saith the Lord. That word you and I need to be speaking forth today of thus saith the Lord. God is coming back. Jesus is coming back. You know, the angel, whenever Jesus ascended into heaven and the disciples were sitting there just with their mouths open and their, their chins to the floor, he said, why are you guys standing around here just looking up at heaven? He said, this same Jesus, he's coming back just like you've seen him go away. Jesus would say it time and time again. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. He said, if I go away, I'm coming back. 
What did we just say about the Word of God? If He has spoken it, it's going to happen. Jesus is coming back. He's not, he's not just sitting in heaven twiddling His thumbs. He's prepared a place for you and I. He is preparing that place. He's getting ready. He's standing at the door. Revelation says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I know that's talking about the door of our hearts and to each and every man. But Jesus is waiting. He's coming back because He said so in His Word and you and I can take Him at His Word. That's one thing we need to get take away from this evening's study that you can take God at His Word. You can believe Him. If He said it, it's going to happen. And we need to be blowing. We need to be sounding the alarm to anybody and everybody that who would, would, would even remotely a little bit listen. Don't be shy. You don't got no reason to be shy. You got no reason to be timid. You or no cause. You don't have to worry, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You don't have to worry about what mama going to think or sister this going to think or neighbor going to think or the whoever it is. You need to sound the alarm. I mean... Think of it this way. If, if there was a fire somewhere, there was a fire in the church or the theater, you know, they, they say, don't yell fire in the theater, you cause a stampede. We need to be causing a stampede in the hearts and lives of men and women, boys and girls, children, in this world who don't know Jesus Christ because they need to be stampeding to get to Jesus. They need to hear the alarm that, yeah, fire's coming. Fires of hell, fire from heaven whenever the Lord comes back to judge the Antichrist and his army and to set up his kingdom. They need to understand that their life is but a vapor and one day if, if the Lord tarries even in his coming and, and the rapture tarries or whatever, every one of us are going, this body is going to give up and we will stand before the Lord. There needs to be an alarm there. An alarm that says, hey! Don't go into eternity without Jesus. Don't go into eternity without having given, putting your faith in who He is and what He did because you ain't going to like the result. The eternity, the eternal abode, where there, the place where you're going to live for eternity is not going to be a joyful, happy place. It's going to be a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, of, of hellfire and brimstone. Boy, we need to bring back some of that preaching, some of that teaching. You know, oh, that just scares people. Yeah, some people need scared because what's going to happen is a scary thing. To go into an eternity without Jesus Christ, without having given Him your heart and your life, is a scary thing. I'd rather, have, I'd rather be scared now and, and, and give my life to Christ then have some old boy pat me on the back and say, oh, you're okay, I'm okay, you're a champion, you know, whatever they may come, you know, it's okay, it's just not mad, let's not hurt their little id, you know, their little psychological self, you know, let's just preach to them cookies and cream and cotton candy, you know, cookies, cream, and cotton candy just rot your teeth. Cookies and cream and cotton candy preaching rot your soul. It will cause your soul to rot. We need to have uh, some Holy Ghost toothbrushing going on. You know, soul brushing, let's put it that way. Some Holy Ghost soul brushing to clean out, you know. You know I was thinking a little bit earlier this week that, uh, you know, sometimes it, God has to be hard, if you will. He has to use some things that are not pleasant to get our attention. Because if everything's always pie in the sky, smooth sailing, we tend to forget God. You know, some of the trials, I was thinking this week as, as we had been talking, you know, some, some things that uh, were said Sunday morning and everything, you know, of, of the storms in our life, the things that happen in our lives, you know, a lot of times we don't understand those things, but God is using those things, even as tragic as they may have been to the loss of a, a loved one, you know, a grandchild or a son or a daughter or a family member or whatever, you know, as, as tragic as those things may have been, you know, a lot of times people will turn away from God. It causes people to question God. But, you know, God is in control of our lives. 
and he, he knows what's coming down the road for us. And had we not had that tragedy, that circumstance, that situation sometimes, you know, that turned us a little here, God sometimes has to get us, you know, by the shoulders, if you will, and say, let's turn this way. Let's turn that way. You know, sometimes there's a, there's a, 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 a you know, those trials come because God's saying, ooh, you're going the wrong way here. Let's just tweak it just a little bit, get you back on the right path. Or because of the way that we're going, maybe, God sees what's ahead of us and He has to use, He has to take something and tweak us and, and, and turn us to keep us from going in that direction to go the direction that He wants us to. You know, because we, we've said that everything that happens in our lives, God allows it so that He can draw us to Him. And you know, that's how we need to understand situations and circumstances. You know, Lord, was I far away from it? Maybe you weren't, but maybe He sees something down the road that He's needing to make an adjustment now so that we didn't go that way. So, you know, even, even some of the tragedies that we see or that we experience in our lives, God is using those things. Maybe, maybe the devil did call. Maybe God gave him leeway. Because as a believer, nothing, I believe that nothing happens to the believer that God doesn't know about, no matter what the area is. You know, we look at Job. Nothing happened to Job but that God did not allow it. He didn't let down that hedge. And He did it for a specific... He did it so you and I could see that what would happen. But He did it as well because He knew Job's heart. He knows your heart. You know, and He's trying to lead you on those paths of righteousness because there may be something down the road that if, 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 if it was allowed to, if we were allowed to continue in that way, they would cause more death, more destruction, more ruin, possibly even the loss of our soul. And God has to use some things or bring some things about in our life, you know, to keep us from going that way. And sometimes it's not a pleasant thing, even when He turns us. It's not a pleasant, if you will, path, but we can know that God has a reason for it. You know, why things happen like they happen is because God is in control and we just need to say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And Lord, yes, I will follow you, Father. You know, had, had certain things not happened in each and every one of our lives, we, I'll guarantee you, I personally had some things not come about and just things, you know, been, you know, I told God, I'm not giving up on you, but I ain't never going back to church again, God, because of what was going on there. And, you know, God will use those things. He used those things to show us and to introduce to us the message of the cross, you know. And, and some of the stuff that goes on in our lives, maybe God is using it to reveal to us, those of us who do have some understanding, and none of us have all the understanding, but He'll use some of those things sometimes to reveal more to us of the message of the cross, of what Christ, and, and what is, I mean, just to stop right there for a second, what is the message of the cross? I know we talk about it, we preach about it, we talk about the gospel. What is the gospel? You know, we understand the gospel is the good news. The gospel and the message of the cross are synonymous terms for one event, one thing, and that is Christ and what He did for us on the cross. What He did for us at Calvary, the message of the cross is the revealing and the understanding of all. The gospel is the revealing and the understanding of all that Jesus did for us at Calvary. Everything that took place there, He did for you and I. Every drop of blood that was shed, every stripe upon His back, the crown of thorns, the spear in His side, all of it was for you and I for a definite purpose that we might be restored to that place of fellowship and communion with God. Now, I want to say something, that, that there is nothing greater than fellowship and communion with God, but it took a horrendous, what we would consider a tragic event of Calvary, that event of Calvary, 
for that reunion, that restoration to take place in our hearts and lives and in every heart and life that has ever accepted Christ, it was because of Calvary, because of the cross. We talked about Sunday about the resurrection. The resurrection is only available to us, being having that resurrection life, that newness of life in Christ Jesus is only made available to us because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The cross is the answer for everything in our lives. It's not just a answer, but it is the answer, the blood of Jesus. When we speak of the blood of Jesus Christ, we're speaking of Calvary. That is the answer. It's not an, one of many. It's not, you know, the only, or it's not just some answer, but it's the only answer. It is, I, I, I listened to a, 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 a sister minister a message this last week as I was doing some driving and, and she brought out the fact that it is the soul answer. There is no other answer. No other answer is needed. The blood of Jesus Christ is solely. And when we speak of the blood, we're speaking of the cross. When we speak of the gospel, we're speaking of the cross. It is solely and only the answer, it is all sufficient. But more than being all sufficient, it's the only thing we need. That's why it, 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 it's, 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 it's uh, tragic for us to try to add to it. The Galatians were adding circumcision. Today we try to add purpose driven or 40 days or 21 days or Memorizing Scripture, nothing wrong with memorizing Scripture. And, and, and that. But if we add it to thinking that that helps it out, then we've negated it and really we've brought death upon ourselves. Because Jesus, He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. You see, that's the sound that we need to be sounding forth. That Jesus Christ is the Soul only, all sufficient, complete. We are complete in Him. Fully fitted for the journey is what the scripture tells us. And He says, As you have therefore received Him, so walk ye in Him. Colossians chapter 2. You know, it tells us in 2 that He defeated all principalities and powers through the cross, through what He did, through His blood, through, through Calvary, by means of. It's what that word through means. He did it all for us and nothing needs added to it. What do you do whenever something is finished? When the cake is finished, you eat it. Right? You don't go back and bake it again. You don't, after, you, after you ladies you, or whoever, you mix up that cake, the, the eggs and the batter and, and whatever else you need in there, you pop it in the oven, that cake comes up, poof, it's there, you put the icing on it, you present it, you put the happy birthday to Billy Bob on that cake, and it's Billy Bob, but you put it before him. What's left to do but eat that thing? You see, what's left for you and I today but to partake? Hmm, that's what that partake is talking about, eating. We partake of all that Christ has done for us at Calvary. We take it in. We, we say, ooh, we taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? That's what you and I need to understand. And, you know, sometimes they make those cakes. It's got lemon here and chocolate here and vanilla here and this and this and that and the other. You know, there's different, if you will, layers of what Christ has done for us at, at Calvary. We don't get to taste it all at once. My son-in-law can sometimes taste something. He says, yeah, it's got this in it and that in it and the other in it. I don't know how he does it. Maybe he just knows the recipe and he's making it all up. I don't know. You know, but we need to taste what Jesus did for us at Calvary today. We need to taste and learn, you know, growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. Paul would say there, we looked at it Sunday, that I may know Him, experience, experiential, experiential knowledge. You know, it's a continual knowing who He is and what He's did understanding more and more and more and more because with Him there is no end. 
you know, we've said it before that even when we get to heaven, we're going to be learning more and more of all that Christ has done for us. We're going to be partaking more and more of Calvary even after we leave this world and we, 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 we go to be with Him in eternity. We're going to be learning more and more all through eternity what He's done for us at Calvary. And that's what we need to be sounding the trumpet, giving forth that, you know, the, the, the thing too about the trumpet, about blowing that trumpet, it was not some, was that a trumpet I hear or was that a guitar? It was distinctive. It makes a distinctive sound. You know, the, uh, the old Calvary, I don't know if they still do it in the military or not, but to charge. They knew what that meant. It was distinctive. You know, the, what is it, Reveille is the time to wake up. They even had, they had a trumpet sound for retreat. You know what, God don't got no trumpet sound for retreat because God don't retreat. God don't need to retreat, amen, because God is all-powerful. We see that here. You see, God doesn't need to turn back. He doesn't need to, to uh, 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 retreat. I said repeat, didn't I? I think I said retreat. God doesn't need to retreat because He is all-powerful and almighty. So we need to be blowing that trumpet, sounding that alarm that the Lord is coming back. And he's coming back on silver clouds of glory. He's coming back and at first is going to be the rapture to take us out of here. And what we see here is him coming back with all his saints. A lot of what we see here in chapter 2, you know, it, it, it goes in with Ezekiel's 38 and 39. There's some of Jeremiah that fits in there. There's Revelation chapter 19 that fits in there. Speaking of, of the, the, the Antichrist and the battle of Armageddon and such. You know, these prophecies that the Lord and this word that the Lord gave 2,600 or so years ago is still uh, apropos. I don't know how you would say it. It's still for us today to understand. You know, he's telling him, he, he, he's given this to his people. He's not telling the world. He's not telling Nebuchadnezzar or any of that. You know, he's not telling the Antichrist, whatever, to sound an alarm. Those guys want to sneak up on you. What does the enemy want to do whenever he's coming in to attack you? He wants to come in privately. He wants to slip in under the radar. He's trying to sneak in to trip you up, to entrap you. You see, God is saying, blow that trumpet. Sound that alarm. Let everybody know. You know, God hasn't even hidden. He hasn't hidden. Think about this. This thing's 2,600 or so years before the battle of Armageddon is going to take place. There is no military. We've just been seeing some stuff on our news about our military and some secrets of the military getting out over Facebook or the, 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 the Internet or something for the, our enemies to see. You see, the, that's not normal military tactic to show your, oh, here's my battle plan. Here's what we're going to do. But God's doing it. God's showing His battle plan. You know why? Because God it doesn't matter because God can show the devil and the world and all of them, anybody and everybody, He can say, this is the plan, boys. This is what's going to happen. Think about it. Because He has the power and the authority and the might to see it through regarding His enemy can know, our enemy can know the battle plan. Mm. Because our God is almighty, all-powerful and there's nothing that the You know what? Here's my plan and you can't stop it. Nanny, nanny, nanny. <laughs> oh my we serve a mighty God. You know, we serve an awesome God. He's laughing at the devil. I showed you my plan and you were still dumb enough to think you could whip me. <laughs> oh my. You know what, believer? We're not ignorant of the enemy's devices. We're not ignorant of his plans. We have the might and the power of the Holy Spirit backing us up because of Calvary. Because of what Jesus did, we don't have to be afraid to say, He's coming back. Get ready. Get your house in order. 
Today your life will be required of you. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Sound the alarm to anybody and everybody. Tell them God's plan. Tell them what's going to take place. If you're dumb enough not to believe it and to go on blind as a bat into it, you got what you deserve. Amen. If you just refuse to believe, you see, that's man's problem. He refuses to believe. Oh, it ain't going to happen. Oh, yes, it is. If it's written in this Word, it's going to happen. Everything, every I dotted, every T crossed, everything in God's Word will positively take place. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants... Listen to that. Let all the inhabitants of the land do what? Tremble. Tremble in fear. Tremble because of what is coming. The Word of God makes the, makes the heart, makes the life tremble. Let's look at that word tremble for just a minute. Agitate, to tremble, to shake. To agitate, to disturb, to rouse up, to provoke. Forty-one times in the Old Testament is utilized most often to express the idea of the physical moving or shaking of someone or something. The physical moving or shaking. You see, whenever the Word of God goes forth, it doesn't just sit there stagnant. It causes movement. It causes a trembling in the hearts and the lives. Whenever you go and you give the Word of God to somebody who is lost or somebody who is wayward or a believer who maybe doesn't understand and you give forth Christ and Him crucified, the Word of God to them, the gospel message of repent and turn away, it's going to cause a shaking. What do you do? What, what is, wake out of sleep is what the Word of God will say in some place. He's going to stand you up and shake you to get you to wake up. We need to be shaking some. We need to be shaking this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This world and the church needs a wake up. It needs you and I to stand up and say, Judgment's coming. Get out of bed, you sleepy. Wake thou that sleepest and arise from your sleep. Hmm. That's, what the, that's the effect that the Word of God has. He says, Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble because the day of the Lord is coming. That's, that's a, a, a uh, term indicative to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The day of the Lord. When you read that in the Bible, in the Word of God, He's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. He says, For it is nigh at 2,600 years ago approximately. <coughs> it was close then. This is in God's perspective. You see, we want to say, oh, they've been saying that ever since grandma and grandpa, great grandma and grandpa, and it hadn't happened yet, so it ain't going to happen now. I heard somebody say the other, oh, it may be two or three hundred years before the Lord's come now. We see things today in this world, it is not going to be too or 300 years. We see the things going on over in the Middle East and over in Europe and Russia and all that kind of stuff. I was listening to a guy the other day. He said the next thing that, 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 that we need to see or that we'll possibly see happen is, is, is the destruction of Damascus. Whether it be those armies gathering there and an accident taking place with a nuclear explosion or something. But the Word of God says Damascus is going to be laid waste. Wow, that's going to take place. I mean, what it explains there is a, it's a place where nobody it will not be inhabited any longer. You know, after that, which kind of refers to probably some kind of a, a nuclear deal. Iran is trying to get nuclear weapons, and they're sending it to Syria and other places like that, sending those things to their proxy people there. They may very well have a dirty bomb or something, and somebody mishandles that thing. Who knows? 
but it's something is going to happen. The day of the Lord is nigh at hand. This is, and, and, and chapter verse, verse 2 here, we could go back to Ezekiel chapter 38 and it says a lot of the same things as it does here in verse 2. He says, a day of darkness, the day of the Lord, whenever He comes back, He says it's a day of darkness and of gloominess. Let's look up gloominess there for a minute. Signifies physical darkness, the plague of darkness, the naive walking in dark. Oh, ooh, yes. The, dar the darkness which causes people to stumble and grope. Metaphorically, it's used to describe the calamity and misfortune that comes to the wicked or the darkness or the day of the Lord is what that's being. But you know, it says a day of darkness and gloominess. Boy, if anything, if anything uh, describes the day in which we live today, I'm talking about a spiritual darkness. You know, where, I mean, my goodness, even five years ago, all this garbage of this transgender and this men thinking they're women and women thinking they're I mean it's more so if you have you noticed I don't know I'm just 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 a little side thing here but have you noticed that there are more men who are pretending saying they think that they're women than there are women the other way around you know that is an attack of the enemy upon man, men, because he knows that the man is to be the head of the family, so forth and so on. But it's a day of darkness. And, and as well, that darkness, like I said, it's a spiritual darkness. Think about this. I mean, we were just talking a little bit earlier about, you know, some of the, the, the true ministers of the Lord, you hear them speaking, and, and there's becoming more of a focus on calling people to repentance and calling the church to repentance and coming back to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, coming back to the cross. But you know, in the, in the last, I don't know, 40 years, I guess maybe, from the 80s on, whenever we started seeing the seeker-sensitive stuff come in and the church growth movement stuff come in and the psychological stuff, you know, really gaining ascendancy in the church, the church has been less of a light to the world in the last 40 or so years than it has ever been in, 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 in the past, even in the time of the Dark Ages, what they called the Dark Ages, whenever the Word of God was chained to the pulpits of the, of the Catholic Church and stuff. But what we see today, because of a lack of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there has been such a cloud of darkness, spiritually speaking, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. The church today, the mega church today for the most part, is a church that's asleep and walking in darkness. The, 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 the example there or the definition there that it gave a gloomy, stumbling in the dark. It's a gloomy time. Oh, don't be preach. You preach gloom and doom. I tell you what, what's coming is gloom and doom. Hmm. We see the darkness all around us. But God's church, God's remnant is going to be shining brighter because as the darkness gets, the darker it is, you think about it, the less light it takes to really penetrate that darkness. You know, even a dull battery run down on the flashlight, as long as there's still some battery in there and it's dark, you can still have a little bit of light. And whenever there's that little bit of light, what's it bring? It brings some comfort. That's the whole thing of a campfire. You know, at nighttime, you're sitting by the camp. It brings some comfort because there's that light and that warmth that light brings. You see, God's, God's church, the church, His people, His true people, are going to be sounding the alarm. We're going to be calling forth, call, uh, and... and, and one of the things of the sound, you know, one of the, the, the major, I think you could say, of the call or the, 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 the blowing of that trumpet is a call to repentance. You look at this letter, this, this prophecy of Joel, 
you know, he's telling his people, he's telling the people of God, God is telling his people to repent and come back to the sacrifice. That's the message that the church needs to be preaching today. A message of repent, turn away from all your wicked ways, everything you've put your faith in that's not faith in Christ and Him crucified, and come back to faith in the cross. Faith in who Jesus is and what He did for us at Calvary. Faith in His way, not our way, but His way. Trusting in who He is and what He's done for us at Calvary. It's a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Mm. As the morning spread upon the mountains, it's covering it all, this darkness, the spiritual darkness. He says, a great people and a strong there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Now he's talking about the army of the Lord. A great people and a strong. There has not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A, fi a fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. This army of the Lord, it's going to take, it's going to consume, it is going to take care of business totally and completely. Nothing is going to be left undone when the Lord comes back. He's not going, there's not going to be a little thing over here and a little thing over there that remain, but He is going to totally take care of it all. What the picture there is, is if you've ever burned a field or seen a field that's burnt, all the trash in the field, everything that had been caught up in the bramble bushes and stuff, it's all burnt down and it's leveled. It may look, it's all blackened, but spring is coming. The rains are coming. Whenever that fire has gone through, it's done, it's out, it's burned up all the bramble and all the weeds and everything, the grass is going to spring forth. It's coming. Hold on. It's coming. It's coming. And when the Lord is done, what's going to be placed, we be in, its, in, in the place of that is going to be wonderful and great. He says, Behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them, he's speaking of this army. This, this is the, the, at, the coming, at the second coming of the Lord as, as He comes back with all His saints in glory to wipe out this army of the Antichrist. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. That tells us there's order. What have we seen there in the Word of God in, in the last little bit, in the last few weeks and stuff that we studied there in, in, in Timothy? God has an order. He has a designed way and His order will be accomplished. He says like they set in battle array before their face... Excuse me. The people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. Basically, they're going to see this army of the Lord coming, and it's going to be like, oh boy, we done messed up. There ain't nothing we can do. Nothing can stop. Nothing can hold back. The power of the enemy is is no, 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 is nothing compared to the power of the Lord our God. You see, and the thing about it is, this army, it's not their own strength and their own ability. It's because of the Lamb, because of the blood of the Lamb, because of what Jesus did for us at Calvary and the power of the Holy Spirit, who is God, that goes before them. Neither shall 
They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. That's that order that we're talking about. There's not going to be anybody going off doing his own thing in this, in this army of the Lord. Everybody's going to be doing exactly what the Lord has laid out. Mm. He says, Neither shall one thrust, thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, oh, get this, they shall not be wounded. You know what that reminds me of? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Mm. This army of the Lord. It says they, they, they're not going to turn on either. They're, they're not going to mistake anybody. There's not going to be any friendly fire that's going to take any of the army of the Lord out. And he also says they shall walk everyone in his past. When they shall fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. No power, no, 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 no weapon formed against them will be able to take them out because God goes before them. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Nothing's going to stop them. They're going to go forth and do that which they've been told to do, which, which, which they've, 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 they've been charged with to do, however you want to look at that. He says, the earth, mm, the earth shall quake before them. That's how we know this is the armies of the Lord. This isn't the Antichrist's army. This isn't some other man-made or, or earthly army. This is the heavenly army of the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven. It says, The earth shall quake, shall shake, shall move before them because of the power of Almighty God that is with them. He says, The heavens shall tremble, even the heavens. Mm. That's power, folks. This is a picture of the power of God Almighty. This is what we have backing us up, if you will. That is why we don't have to worry. We don't have to fret. We don't have to be in fear of the power of the enemy. I was trying to get that across to a Sunday morning about, the, about that resurrection power that we have because of Calvary. What do we got to fear of the, the, the devil's nothing? He's that ant that gets flicked off the page, off the picnic table, whatever. He's trying to partake. He's trying to get in your picnic and eat up your sugar and your crumbs and God's saying, be off with you. When he comes against you, the Lord rebuke you. Get thee behind me, Satan. We have that authority because of Calvary. We can walk <coughs> in that authority because of Calvary. Why are we so timid? Brother Lonnie was telling me after service Sunday, he was listening to some things and these people that have been part of some of uh, the CIA this different things, even in our government, whatever they might be, but they've been a part of the what the Illuminati, the one world government, this thing, this, this stuff that we see trying to set up this darkness in the world today. He was telling me he saw some interviews from some folks that had been part of that, and he said, do you know what they fear more than anything? They fear the church. They fear the people of God because they know that we have the power of Almighty God at our disposal, that we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit because of Calvary. Do you, you know why the enemy don't want you to understand and know what it is that Jesus did for you at Calvary? Because whenever you do and you start applying that to your life and you walk in that, you are more than victorious over the world, the flesh, and what? The devil! You, we have the victory already in Christ because of the cross. We need to start walking in that resurrection life. Mm. You've been risen with Him already to walk in newness 
of life. Newness of life. Not the old way. The old way you were defeated. The old way you were bound by sin. The old way the sin nature had control over you. But we have been raised to newness in life. We have been set free from that power of the sin nature. We've been set free from that power of the old man's self. We've put him off. And we've put on Christ. And we're being renewed daily. That means we're growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. We're learning more and more, or should be each day, of what Christ has done for us. And as we learn it, and we apply it, and we walk in it, that's what sets the demons of hell afright and afraid. Mm, they fear you. And yet we're sitting back here saying, Oh, I just don't know where, where, where. They're beating me up. Yeah, they're going to beat you up if you just sit around and you don't know who you are in Christ Jesus. Not because you confess it, but because you have it and you know it in Jesus Christ because of Calvary. You see, it all goes back to the cross. What did it say in Colossians chapter 2, 14 and 15? It said He defeated all. Not some, not a few, not most. All principalities and powers and He made a show of them. You know, he, he displayed, He said, Ha ha, you're whipped. He made a show of them at the cross. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us at Calvary. You can walk, you need to be walking in that resurrection power of Jesus Christ understanding it's through Calvary and your faith in Calvary. Not in the resurrection, but in what Christ did for us. At Cal you see, we've messed it up. we put our faith in the resurrection thinking, oh, I'm, I'm living a resurrection life and we're still dominated by the sin nature. But when our faith is in Christ and Him crucified, when it's in the proper object, then we know the power to live free from the dominion of the sin nature we're not in condemnation, as Romans 8 would talk about, who walk in the flesh but not in the Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemning. There's no accusation against them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit or according to from the power source of the Spirit. You see, because we have the help of that's the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That as our faith is in who He is and what He's done, the Holy Spirit is the power source that we need to overcome the world, the flesh. And Did you know you're more than an overcomer through Him that loved us? No weapon formed you shall, against you shall prosper. There's no weapon of the enemy that can take you out, spiritually speaking. None. We can rise up above every situation and circumstance because of the, of, a, of the cross. Not because of us or our strength. This army is not because of who they are. It's because of whose they are. You don't have the strength because of who you are, but because of whose. Whose are you? I belong to Jesus. I'm a child of the King. He is my master and He will fight my battles for me. Be still and see the salvation of our God. Mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Mm, that's all I can say. Mm. Let's walk in it, folks. Facebook, YouTube, walk in it. Walk in the power that is yours in Christ Jesus by means of the Holy Spirit and the cross of Christ. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. Every demon in hell ought to be trembling before the church today. And they will if the church will come back to the cross. They will tremble because they know. What did them little demons say that was in the, that guy, the demoniac of Gadara? Jesus went and he, he cast them out. They said, oh, wave these demons. They said, don't, don't, don't cast us out. Don't, don't cast us into the darkness before our time. Send us in. They, was, they wanted to go into the pigs 
because they knew Jesus had the power. Already, he didn't come back to win the power. He didn't go to Calvary to win the power for himself. He come back to win it back for us. Hmm. That whenever we say, be gone, and cast into them pigs, they have to obey. Do you know the demons in hell have to obey whenever we say, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the blood, I rebuke you, Satan. I rebuke you, you demonic little whatever. They have to obey because we got the power of the Holy Spirit backing us up, going before us even. Amen? What do we have to be afraid of, folks? The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark or be as darkness. You know, because of the glory of the light of the Lord, the sun and the moon is going to be like they weren't even there. That's what that's talking about. The stars shall withdraw their shining. All of the stars of the sky. You know, the closer you get to the city, the fewer the stars you see because all the city lights. That's kind of what this is talking about. Whenever Jesus comes back in all His glory and splendor with the armies of the host of heaven, there is going to be such a brightness, such a glory shining that... There ain't going to be no new need for the moon, the sun, the stars. It'll be like they're not even there. That's what it tells us in there in Revelation as well. And the Lord, listen to this, the Lord shall utter His voice Mm-mm-mm. at His word. At His word. He shall utter His voice before His army. For His camp is great. For He is strong that executes His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. You know, let's look at that because sometimes we get, get uh, oh yes, very awesome. It's a day to be feared. Mm. To fear the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day, it's a day of reckoning. Because he's going to call into account everything. Mm. You know, it's better to know him as Savior than to face him as judge. You don't want to face him as your judge. He took the judgment upon himself for you. That we don't have to have that judgment. Receive him today and know Him as Savior, or else on this day or someday, maybe today or tomorrow, you're going to die, and you're going to face Him as judge. You don't want to face Him as your judge. The day of the Lord is great and very terrible. It says, who can abide it? That word abide means to contain, to hold it back, to keep it at bay, Nobody can keep it at bay. Nobody can stop it. God's word will come to pass. Just as He has said it, just as He has proclaimed it, just as He has given it, every last little bit, as I've been saying this evening, is going to take place as He has said. And nothing on hev- in heaven and nothing in earth can hold it back because God is almighty and His word shall be accomplished. Amen? Amen? Do you believe it? Then let's start living it. Amen? Amen. If we believe it, we're going to be living it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening. We ask, Father, that this word would get into the hearts and the lives of the hearers, Lord, that your name would be glorified, that you would be exalted, Father. Lord, give your people, Lord, your church, that renewed desire, Lord, that that renewed sense of urgency, Father, to take your gospel message to this lost and this dying world, Lord, to shine that light of the gospel in the darkness of this world, Lord, before it's too late. Lord, that we would take serious, Father, what you have provided for us at Calvary. 
And Lord, that we would apply it to our hearts and our lives, seeking to know more, Father, of what you have done for us. Lord, I just thank you, Lord. I ask that if anybody's listening later on by YouTube, that, Lord, that they wouldn't wait another minute, Father. But, Lord, this word would convict their hearts that if they don't know you, Father, that they would turn their hearts to you, that they would repent, Lord, and know you today as their Savior. <clears throat> that, Father, they wouldn't have to face you tomorrow as their judge. Lord, give us a sense, of, a renewed sense of urgency to preach this gospel to be about the Father's business, to take care of that, Lord, which you have put into our trust, to minister to your people, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.